Let me formally welcome you to another episode of the Reva Revolution. My name is Jordan Pryor. I'm a marketing manager here at Reva. And we created the series because every day our clients remind us that we are in the middle of a business revolution where the focus of the enterprise has shifted from shareholder returns to customer value. This means that people, processes, and systems must reorient to put the customers in the center. This series of conversations with Reba's all-star guests, also known as revolutionaries, is our way of exploring the ways leading organizations use data and CRM to empower their teams and improve the customer experience. And of course, sharing information with that field. So today we have some really special guests for those of you uh, in the insurance industry, two of the best known insurance industry experts, Emily Bennett and Bob King. Over the next hour, you'll get a ringside seat as they let you in on some of the top strategies deployed by industry leaders as they build our digital future. Um, their discussion is planned to take about 45 minutes and we should have plenty of time to answer questions from the audience. So again, please feel free to enter your questions in the GoToWebinar Q&A panel um, and we will make sure that we answer them at the end of the events. And with that, I am pleased to introduce Betsy Peters. Uh, Reva's VP of Marketing and Product Strategy, who will lead the panel. Betsy has worked at the intersection of business strategy and emerging technologies for the past 20 years, raising funds, building products, leading teams, and managing growth. And I know she's thrilled to learn from Bob and Emily today. So with that, over to you. Thank you so much, Jordan. And again, Bob and Emily, it is wonderful to have you both here. If we could bring up webcams. So we can see your faces. That would be terrific. There we go. Nice to see you guys again. Good to see you, Betsy. All right. Well, before we dive into our excellent questions today, I'd love it if you each would give the 90-second version of your bio by answering the question, why the insurance industry? And what's your mission with the personal coach? So let me start with Emily, and then we'll get to you, Bob. Thank you, Betsy. Um, so I've been in the technology field for a, a very long time as, since I graduated from university many years ago with my business degree. I focused on training and support. Um, I worked for a large insurance company and spent most of my time working with advisors and their teams implementing the technology that the insurance company had for the advisor, but also looking at the technology they had and helping them integrate it better into their practice. Um, so I spent about 15, 16 years doing that. In the last five years with that company, I moved to corporate where I worked in and led teams in large enterprise level IT projects. Um, so I retired from that work about three years ago. I joined the personal coach as a technical coach and I specialize in CRM systems. And I truly love being back with advisors um, and their teams and helping nudge them to use the technology better and helping them implement new and exciting technologies. That's great. Well, uh, we're glad you came out of retirement to talk to us today. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Bob, over to you. Uh, well, Betsy, I joined the insurance industry right out of school and uh, joined a, a company called Great West Life. Some may know it in Winnipeg, uh, uh, now part of the Canada Life family. But I joined Great West Life way back then in the group business and <clears throat> uh, was part of the insurance business uh, for like 40 years before I retired eight years ago. So. Uh, uh, I've seen lots of interesting change and development in the insurance business. Uh, and most of us at the personal coach uh, actually have worked together, uh, have some similar views and some less similar views on different topics, but uh, that makes our meetings quite interesting when we get together. Uh, but uh, you know, the personal coach is a boutique coaching firm uh, uh, and it lends itself to one-on-one -on -one coaching, very focused uh, at the advisor level and uh, all that background sort of comes into play on a, on a pretty regular basis. That's great. Well, we're thrilled to have you here because um, 
I want to frame up some of the changes that we see at Riva going on in this industry and, and get a lot of your feedback. So at Riva, we sit at this intersection of customer data and the workflows that support advisors, salespeople, and other kind of revenue generating or revenue supporting roles. But we mostly work closely with the IT teams responsible for CRM and the other platforms that store uh, and collect that customer data. So one of the things that we've been exploring a lot lately with our revolutionaries on the Revo Revolution is um, how is digital transformation requiring a third type of intelligence, right? So good ideas come from very high business IQ and good customer relationships are formed by those with really high emotional quotients um, and the natural ability to connect. But good results come from the combination of those things um, and by people who are willing to pull out all the stops and smooth over the barriers that are in the way of success. And more and more that is requiring a development of a third kind of intelligence, which is technology quotient. So TQ is what we're really exploring. Uh, the ability to leverage AI and automation and technology platforms to really enhance human capabilities in selling. So that's kind of the backdrop I'd love to set as we dive into some of these questions. And I'm, I'm curious if you're experiencing this uh, in your practice at The Personal Coach. How is digital transformation changing the insurance industry? And are you experiencing what we are in terms of this need for a higher technology quotient at the advisor level? Yeah, Emily, do you want to talk a bit about the, the technical side of that? Sure. So. Yes, of course. And we are seeing that um, from a technical perspective, um, I think it's it, advisor practices are being forced into using the technology, all the teams. And I think in a lot of offices, the technology was seen more of as a back office tool. And with, especially with the changes we've all had to deal with over the last few months, implementing technology quickly um, has been and it, it come to the forefront. So things like centralizing your technology so staff can work from home or um, work anywhere, the, um, the, the need to meet with clients remotely and bumping up that technology so that you have a seamless method of meeting with the client. I'm also seeing changes in uh, even something simple like booking meetings, using tools to help with that process. So we're seeing changes um, come to the, the the practice to help make things a little bit easier. Um, I'm also seeing a move towards centralizing the, the technology, moving to cloud-based systems uh, because of that ease of use, that ease of transition to remote. It's a big weight that comes off having to keep an on-premise system either by moving it to VDI or moving it to the cloud is, is a key element that we're seeing a lot of. Terrific. And I guess in the, uh, on the EQ side of, of the ledger, I mean, it's, it's clearly, it's clear to us that things like compliance uh, are not going away. They're not gonna get lighter. Uh, the load to to perform all tasks relative to to uh, things like compliance can be managed a lot using uh, CRM and and information within there and the ability to track um, and fundamentally Betsy uh, a couple of strong beliefs that we would have as an organization is. Uh, if you measure stuff, it will improve. CRM gives you a little more leverage in terms of ability to measure and, and gauge performance. Uh, and the other fundamental belief that we would feel very strongly about is uh, it's important to understand your business, to segment it and to develop a service program that lines up with that segmentation. And a lot of that work can be done via the CRM, via that technology. So that often 
uh, is one of the very early stages of any coaching work that we do is to determine what the business actually looks like. And it's quite surprising at times, uh, the revelations that come out of that exercise. Yeah, I'm curious about that, Bob. Um, I, I, the It's easy to measure in CRM. I think um, we've all been there as an industry and, and the advisors believe that, but how do you take it a step farther than measurement and really leverage what it's showing you to iterate and do better? Do you have any good anecdotes about that or what yeah, advice well, do you give folks in the field about embracing TQ and then leveraging it for better EQ, right? Yeah, yeah. well, I'll, I'll give, a, a, I'll make some comments about that. And then Emily, if you have uh, some observations, feel free to jump in. But uh, uh, quite often, uh, one of the, the uh, themes that, that comes up is the, the notion that an advisor needs to hire additional support staff. And one of the things that the CRM can, uh, can help us do is understand uh, who's doing what and the sort of volumes involved. Um, and again, back to the segmentation conversation, who are they doing it for? Are they doing it for the best customers of the practice or are the are the less, less best customers of the practice sucking up a fair bit of resource? And can we adjust that? Can we can we regauge that that response? And part of that again is that segmentation exercise and the the service program that goes with that, aligning that, making sure that uh, the right people and the right customers are getting the right attention. The right customers can lead us to more right customers. There's lots to leverage in terms of that that type of information. So Emily, I don't know if you'd have other observations there. Um, I just want to add some uh, anecdote, anecdotes just recently. So one area, two areas specifically come to mind. One is when you have staff that have been working in the team for a while and they know how to work with certain types of products. So they know how to do the back office functions. Um, and one of the things we've done in the IT space is we've started creating templates of the steps that are needed to process a certain type of financial transaction or a certain type of insurance with a certain insurance company, because of course, there some of them are different than others. And by being able to document that in their CRM system, they, they can then use it as a training opportunity as they hire new staff, because they can take that historical data, build a template, and then when they have new staff, the new staff can follow those instructions that are in the template. It's kind of automation because it, it, you know, it, it still needs a human to execute the steps, but the steps are laid out logically and it gives the new, the new staff more confidence when they have to execute those steps, which is always great. And the second example is around pre-meeting and post-meeting notes, um, planning for those events, and um, dele delegating the tasks that come out of a particular client meeting. We're looking at finding ways to automate those types of things to make it easy to um, not miss something because that's what you want to avoid. This, this, these businesses are about relationships. So you want to make sure you've captured the gist of those conversations. And if you have action items that they get actioned appropriately. Yeah, I'm curious about that, Emily. Um, for the advisors that personal coach supports, what's their typical tech stack look like that they're interacting with on a daily basis? What what types of uh, applications support their work primarily? Or Bob, either one of you. You don't want Bob <laughs> talking about tech stacks. <laughs> well, I'll give you the typical consultant's answer. It depends. Of course. <laughs> um, some are driven by email and uh, chat functions like um, uh, like Teams or um, Messenger or, or just chat um, where they're discussing with the team what they need to do. 
some advisors are very into the CRM system. One of the things I like to do is I like to build some kind of analytics so that I always use the analogy when you're drinking your coffee, you're getting ready to start your day, you can look to see how things are going. To Bob's point about segmentation, the next level after that is to identify um, and, and identify your segmented levels and the kind of service you want to provide to those levels. And we can use the analytics to help see if you're on track um, or where you um, have to pay attention to certain elements of the of the practice. Um, so we have a wide variety of use use cases. And you know the systems will depend on the practice and and um, how you use it is important. So we try to understand what you have and how can you use it better before we start implementing something new. I like to say that from a CRM perspective, for example, I'm CRM agnostic. I'm more I'm more concerned that you use the CRM that you have and you've outgrown it. Then we can move you to something that has a little more automation or a little bit um, more integration with other back office systems. That makes sense. So how do the best advisors embrace uh, technology? What's their how would you characterize like your star people in terms of? their morning and their afternoon and their evening? Well, um, again, one of the things that we like to stress when it comes to technology and, and specifically the CRM scenario is that uh, it needs a champion in the organization, right? An owner, somebody that can ensure that it's uh, being fed appropriately and 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 being nurtured and and so uh the real good practices have that champion in place and that champion becomes very adept at at uh monitoring and 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 pulling out of the the technology useful information and making sure that the right information is going in as well so uh, that's certainly something that the real good practices have in place in some fashion. Depending on the size of the practice, it will look different from one to another. But that notion of ownership, I think, is really important. It, it gives, it's the lifeblood, I think, of, of uh, making those CRM systems useful. Um, but the rest of it varies very much from practice to practice. And so, uh, I'm sure Emily can speak in more detail about some of the technical pieces, but uh, uh, the good advisors have got their processes embedded in the CRM. And so if they're onboarding a new client, once that client is entered into the system, it it starts to think for you in terms of when the next steps have to happen and who they're assigned to. and. Uh, it becomes uh, it becomes a very slick way of handling those routine process type scenarios. Uh, so that would be my observation around best practice types of uses. Uh, that and regular reviews of the segmentation piece for advisors who are looking to to recalibrate their business, maybe pair off uh, some clients, uh, they can zero in very quickly on on where that type of, of practice management focus uh, uh, needs to zero in on. Right, so it sounds like you've got a little bit of kind of business process benefit with the CRM that you identified. You've got some uh, optimization in terms of segmentation, et cetera. Anything that you guys experience in terms of real growth opportunities that, and it may be segmentation, it leads you right back there, but um, how about the the growth opportunity side of business benefits of CRM? Yeah, well, again, from the business coaching piece, it's, it's, uh, 
it's a way to not let opportunities fall between the cracks. Uh, whether it's a client opportunity or a, or a center of influence opportunity. Uh, once those, again, once they're in the system, there are, are opportunities to build in the drip process, right? Like what do we need to do to keep in touch? What do we need to send? Uh, what are they really interested in? And if, how do we get that to them? Uh, so I think that opportunistic kind of mindset uh, can be very well supported via the CRM. Uh, uh, with an enforced block of business, there are always opportunities that will present from that perspective as well. So client campaigns that can be very specific based on the criteria that's been entered into the CRM system, uh, needs that, that might fit those specific criteria. Uh, so I, I, I mean, those opportunity uh, factors uh, are large and do not need to be overlooked. They do not need to be onerous. And the CRM can help, again, zero in on what those opportunities might present. And I know, Emily, you might have some thoughts on, you know, how to slice and dice and what you're, what are you trying to get at there? Yeah, uh, so I think the referrals element, most CRMs have some referral capability where you can connect client A to a lead or a family member because a lot of our advisors work with families. And it's important that as you work with a family over the years that you maintain that relationship and you have a place where you can document those notes about the upcoming family um, the upcoming generation, I should say. Um, and, you know, they may not be your client today, but they might be in the future. So a, a good CRM system allows you to connect those contacts together and then also um, have you capture those notes so that you can remember the school they went to and all of those big life events that happen in a family. Um, and... Uh, give you a place to to identify where they where they are and store them. So um, like I just saw Bob do, we all drink the Kool-Aid a little bit on CRM. What, the, what do you do to convince some of the recalcitrant advisors who don't believe in it or don't want <laughs> bothered with it? What's what are some of the tips that you guys use? Were you ready to jump there, Emily? Go ahead. Well, I was going to say that most teams have a CRM system of some kind. It may not be one of the ones we would all recognize, but they are doing CRM. Um, and they are looking for ways to make it easier. Or how do we automate it? Or how do we... You know, I'm growing my staff and it's taking so much time. And how do I how do I um, put this knowledge in? Sometimes it's motivated by an assistant who's been with the advisor for years and has announced a retirement. All that knowledge is in in your head. And now you've got to get it someplace. So usually that is the um, thing that brings them to the tech technical CRM, a traditional CRM system of some kind. Um, sometimes in our practices, the a dealer might enforce the CRM on the advisor. So they are using a CRM that way because they've been told they have to use it, they, they pay for it, it's part of their package, um, and they'll have to learn to use that CRM functionality. Um, and that kind of opens the door and gets them started on the CRM system. And, and then what we'll do is use, a, use that system to help them see the integration side. So this is your customer database, but now you want to put that data in Excel because you want to do a mailer. Let's see how we can do that. And so that kind of opens, it puts the toe in the water, if you will, about technology and, um, databases and integration and all those key things that we like to see in a practice to help use the technology effectively. Yeah, Betsy, I would just add to that that uh, 
that's this whole conversation is in part about the importance of having a champion somebody that can energize that conversation right most advisors god love them do not like to dive in to that technology world too deeply and so uh it is really important that someone in the organization can grab hold of that and put some passion into it um it's also important that we are able to get advisors to think about technology as not an expense but an investment right like they it is an investment in their business it will it can make their business better bigger more valuable down the road when it comes time to to recognize that in some fashion but um that passion for somebody in the organization to take hold of it and run with it and and sort of leverage the power that it can bring is really the critical point and tell me about those people um tell me about like an average uh person at an advisor level is it isn't an advisor or is it a um support person or what do you usually run across in terms of the champion? Well, I'll take a quick stab and then again, Emily might have some uh, uh, observations, but uh, it takes, I mean, frankly, there's no one answer to that. I mean, it might be a young advisor within the practice, somebody that's real comfy with that technology world and, and aspects of it and who is not intimidated by by that technology piece at all or it may be if the practice is large enough it might be a senior staff member uh that has been deemed the champion the owner of the system the the one the go-to person if you will of around the can i do how does it do kind of questions uh but really uh you know, if it's just a machine sitting on the desk, uh, you know, you're going to get what you put into it. And and those are the advisors that we need to sort of try and do a wake up call with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. And I, it's like I said before, it's using the technology that you have and making the most out of it. And like the goal is to outgrow it so that you can, and you'll move into something with a, with more power, however that is. Um, but the champion is the, the key uh, because they will drive that, that technology. They will drive the automation. They will drive the reporting um, and they will ensure that the practice itself remains scalable and adaptable because they've implemented those best practices in the technology that they have today. That's the ideal situation is when you've got those best practices in your technology um, and that allows you to have that ability to scale and grow easily. And um, what are the usual friction points you hear about the advisors adopting? Is it fear or is it um, having to enter into two systems? Is it, what, what do you guys experience in terms of the reasons why they don't want to adopt? I'll take this one, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's a, a little bit of usability um, because there's so many systems that you wouldn't that you need to work with. Um, and like I said before, a lot of financial services and insurance companies use different software. So when you're um, work when you're an advisor, you've got a different focus than your back office staff might have. But you both have a lot of technology that you have to use. So usability is the, a big stumbling block and adoptability. Some people called it user adoption, same thing. It's getting to use the technology and use it and stay with it, right? Because sometimes it doesn't do exactly what you want, but you can't articulate what you want. So you get in that sort of a hamster wheel, if you will, of, of um, not being able, not want, not being able to use it because it doesn't do what you want, but you can't articulate what you want. 
so it doesn't do it. And then you, the technology just sits on a desktop somewhere. Um, so it's it's having that clear vision of what it is you want to do and and use the technology as best you can to do it. And if not, then let's look for something that will do it, will do what you want. Yeah, that sounds a lot like uh, we talk a lot about this at Reva, where it's people don't want another software. They want the customer data to be right where they want it when they need it so that they can yeah. actually, right? So yeah. it's really, I think it, it's an interesting time in the industry because I think everybody's waking up to the fact that data is the new oil and we need the oil to get in the engine, right? And, you know, software is fine for what it is, but the most important thing is making sure that there's no friction in between that customer data and the person who's going to use it. So we we try to solve those problems all the time and it's not easy. Bob, you were well, going to say. Yeah, I was. Thanks, Betsy. I, I, I mean, it, this might seem like stating the obvious, but uh, there, the advisor's level of comfort is also quite closely tied to the level of support they feel they can get to gain that comfort. And so, you know, advisors that are attached to a dealer or to a certain insurance company uh, might be getting a whole lot more support than advisors that are on their own uh, without any formal support from a from any institutional organization, et cetera. So, uh, you know, that that support piece is a very critical part of comfort. And, you know, so some of our clients uh, are able to interact with Emily to, to get that level of support uh, that they can't get elsewhere or don't get elsewhere uh, or choose not to get elsewhere, I guess. But, uh, uh, but those that are well supported and can access that support can go to someone with questions to get that comfort level to an increased point uh, are far more effective in dealing with the technology and and the input requirements. The you know the the data going in uh -huh. uh, is what really makes it more effective, most effective, uh, obviously. So uh, that'd be my two cents on that that issue. How often are you experiencing, given uh, Emily, you were talking about chat and um, you know email, and I'm sure there are documents and Excel files and things like that that are being shared. Um, how much is that a friction point in terms of getting all of those types of information into CRM and convincing convincing an advisor that to take the time to do that, as Bob was saying, it's about the data going in so you can use it the next time. Yeah. Um, so not, one of the things that I'd like to do is find out a little bit more about the process of booking client meetings with clients is, and I'll often say, walk me through a typical day, a typical week when you want to meet with clients, when do you have your meetings with your staff to talk about upcoming meetings? Um, and then that usually triggers input like and what that does for me is trigger a template because templates are great people get templates um, and you can even use some tools to build a template for you and when you're filling out the questions on the on the screen it's different it doesn't feel like data input it's certainly not as nerdy as data input so but really that's what they're doing you're filling in the data you're filling it in a, a spot on the screen um, and then it gets input behind the scenes to, to a CRM system usually. Now, one of the, so once I look at it from that perspective, who actually keys it in, it doesn't matter. So if the advisor wants to do it, that's fine. Some um, advisors can be more technically inclined. They'd like typing in the client notes. It helps them process the um, summarizing the notes for the client. So they, they actually like after a client meeting, typing in the notes for that process. Some don't. Some will use um, paper, hand write some notes, and they hand it off to someone else. But the notes are still getting in there. And it doesn't, one's not more right over the other. It, it's that the 
the information is getting into the CRM system. So as once we talk about that as a team and realize that, oh, so I really don't have to use the CRM system. No, but you have to pay someone to type in your notes. So it's your decision on how you want to get that data into the CRM system because everyone's agreed that it is valuable. Um, and that usually starts a good conversation about getting the data into a CRM system. And the other piece of that is one of the things I love about almost all the, the CRM and all the technology now, it allows you to customize for the office. So, um, you know, I'm old enough to remember the olden days where you would have a hundred screens on the, on the main page and you only use like five or six up at the top and then there were some fields down at the bottom, but you couldn't modify it because everybody had to use the same screen. Well, the beauty of the technology today is you can actually create different views for different users. Um, and often when I get involved in a practice and I hear comments about, I can't find the data that I want, I quickly show them how to filter data in a view um, in whatever system they're using. And for a lot of them, it's been a game changer because they had no idea that it was that easy to see clients that I saw yesterday. Instead of having to manually key in each one and type the note, I can actually click on a button and it'll show me the clients that I saw yesterday. So it, I can use that as an entry point. So having the ability to customize the view that you're looking at um, so that your CRM system is showing you just what you care about. Um, and then looking at the process from end to end and defining who's going to key in what information is the two key pieces. I wanted to, to uh, bring up. That's great. Um, we were talking a little bit before everybody else got on about how Revo really supports enterprise IT folks. And I'm wondering, given what you just said, um, what are the one or two things that you would want them to know that would be the most helpful to the advisors in the field? What could they change about the way they do their business? What could they do in addition to that would really be a game changer for those advisors in the field. I will defer to Emily to start that response. <laughs> um, I would say ask some good questions to find out end to end how something's done. Like I talked about the client meeting process. Um, again, end to end, not just because I think in CRM, we just looked at the client left, now we gotta enter our meeting notes or we gotta schedule the meeting. But take it one step further and ask questions around how do you know which clients you wanna see? And that might lead you to a whole conversation about segmentation. Why is it you wanna see that client three times a year? So understanding the process from end to end is a key, key element. And knowing how whatever system it is that's being promoted, know the customization or capabilities of that system so that you could adapt it for that user. And, you know, especially now, because not everybody has to look at the same screen in the same system. Most software gives you the ability to customize it, take advantage of it, reduce the clutter, make, make the team focus on just what they need. And behind the scenes, the technology will do the magic. Yeah, and I would, I mean, Betsy, there's no one size fits all here, right? And it's important that people keep that in mind. Like there, there is no one perfect solution probably. And each producer, each advisor scenario will have a a twist or a turn that, that comes with it. And, you know, so the, you know, the, the enterprise has to be nimble enough to respond to some of those differences and and be providing solutions that can be leveraged by multiple types of of users. Uh, so I'm I'd be hopeful that enterprise scenarios aren't trying to put too much of it in boxed up fashion and that there is a fair bit of flexibility that can be inherent in those solutions. I'd also be saying, uh, 
that you know the institutional the institutions and the enterprises uh, need to be just as clear on things like compliance as do the advisors. They need to be crystal clear on what those developments are and try to be just ahead of that game, just ahead of that curve in coming to the forefront with solutions for those things and for advancements that might help solve for streamline responses to those those types of topics. Uh, that would be my two cents worth on that. Yeah, that's a great, a great topic to dive into for a second, which is, you know, really how has technology changed the landscape around compliance for better or for worse? And and what are new challenges that you're facing in that compliance realm? Well, I mean, it's it's constantly evolving. And and so the solution that worked last year somebody better be paying attention to it to make it relevant this year. And so, uh, you know, I mean, those, we're trying to figure out upcoming changes at this point that might impact different practices, et cetera. And it's, it's very complex. I'm not suggesting for a moment that it's easy. It's not. Uh, but, uh, that's where the enterprise can certainly be helpful in utilizing resources appropriately to understand and develop those solutions. At the advisor level, in the heat of battle, it's very difficult for them to digest and action changes that, that might help them out. It's the forest and the trees at times, right? So, Again, it's got to be nimble. Uh, there needs to be a real strong focus on developing those solutions and building those into CRM offerings as quickly as possible uh, and support that introduction, like make people aware of what those tools might look like and, and, and the ability to leverage those. Emily, anything to add there? I'd agree. I think um, that the CRM system has to be flexible enough to be able to handle um, any new regulations or any new uh, topics that come up from a compliance perspective. So absolutely. Um, CRM is a key piece of software that helps the advisor ensure that they stay compliant. Um, and I love the word nimble and agile, right? Being able to um, be flexible enough to change how you might do something to to comply with another uh, compliance rule is important too. Yeah, and again, this is the water that we swim in all the time at Riva, where we're constantly thinking about <clears throat> freeing the data from the various systems that it's in, and then making sure that it gets flowed into the right workflow to the right person to make sure that there's no tripwires around compliance. So a lot of the times it's not even the software, the CRM software, it's actually the data in the background and the operational work that goes on with the data to get it back into the CRM. Uh -huh. It is complex stuff that's changing all the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a question from the audience, if you guys are ready for that. Um, wow. I know. Uh, Harpreet is asking, he says, I've used two different CRM systems in two previous companies. One was as a, uh, an advisor in a bank. My experience with the systems were starkly contrasting. Number one, is it that a certain CRM might be more relevant to an organization and it's best to move to a different one to get better results? Or two, it doesn't matter what the CRM, but how it's integrated in the company is more important. So thoughts on that question? Go ahead, Emily. So uh, so are, are we choosing which is the better of the two approaches? I think it was framed as a, a as an either or. Okay, I, I, I mean, would vote the CRM, for the second. Does the CRM approach. fit the organization or can you make the organization fit the CRM type of thing? <laughs> I prefer that the software fits the, um, the organization because it doesn't matter what the software is. If it's not going to work with the organization, it just is not going to be used properly and it's going to sit 
and people won't access it. They don't trust the data that's there. So the software, the software should really fit what the organization does. In fact, that's my first question when I'm asked, so well, what's the best CRM system out there? It depends <laughs> on what you want to do. Uh, let's look at that first, and then we'll look at the CRM that's out there that can help you. Because sometimes it's not CRM. It could be CRM with other products, and together it might uh, integrate and give you everything that you're looking for. Yeah, it's it's complex, and uh, I know Emily's developed a, a CRM solutions checklist that she uses when she's talking to clients, and you know it helps it helps get things out of their heads and onto paper, such that you know we can all look at the same information and make more relevant decisions based on what those needs really are, because uh, it's not top of mind for them typically. It, it's a conversation that has to has to be forced to happen. Yeah. Um, we'll wait for a second for any other questions from the audience. But I guess as we're um, as we're wrapping up and waiting for that, is there um, anything in particular that you've seen work really well to use CRM to support maintaining a client relationship? You know, any any way that you advise your clients to leverage CRM to keep, because sometimes these relationships and insurance go on for 20 some odd years, right? So mm -hmm. how do you use CRM to develop that kind of dynamic? Well, uh, again, from my perspective, it's the development of that, that service program that goes with the segmentation, right? It's, uh, that's the driver of, of uh, the level of contact, the level of support, uh the types of meetings the frequency all of that stuff drives off of that service program and and the organized the advisor organization is completely aligned with that and uh you know we want the advisor focused on doing what he does best and that typically is client work it's not filling out forms right it's not phoning to make appointments right uh, I want those advisors in front of clients in some fashion on some regular basis. And I want that prioritized by the, the type of client that we're talking about. And so uh, if an advisor can manage that part of his business effectively using the CRM, he, will, he or she will see uh, very positive outcomes from that, very positive. Yeah, I'd agree. And you were talking about compliance previously. And uh, one of the things that I used to talk about with CRM is it helps you stay compliant because you're documenting all those important client interactions. Um, and then it also allows you to leave. So when it's time to, you know, shut in the olden days when you used to shut down your computer at the end of the day um, and walk away, you knew that you accomplished everything you said you were going to do that day. Your task list is done and you didn't, you know, you're not at home at 11 o'clock at night re remembering something that you forgot to do for a client and that's due the next day. That doesn't happen because you've documented your tasks, you've got all the proper check and checks and balances within the system to make sure you're not forgetting about those important things. And so you can focus on the relationship and building that practice and, and um, building the team as well, the internal team. And Betsy, just one last point on that, if I yeah. may, sorry. I, uh, uh, one of the reasons I'd like to advisors to think of of the CRM and the technology as an investment is, it really does improve the value of their business. There will come a day when they want to exit the business uh, or our approach to sell the business, uh, merge somewhere, whatever. Uh, I, I think it's well understood that a, a practice with a well-oiled machine, if you will, when it comes to technology and CRM, et cetera, uh, has an increased value. It it will pay back. Yeah, I think that's a good point. It's like the 
um, physical manifestation of the relationships, right, in some ways. And then back to Emily's point, it's the, um, it's the idea of putting IQ into motion, right? So your task lists, the things that you have to do to make sure that you've served your client, all those things are done in a way that frees up your creativity and your relationship building so that you can spend more time doing the things you love, which in this business, generally speaking, are working with people, right? So I think um, I think that's an excellent point, Bob, and a, and a good one to, to move into our lightning round, which has nothing to do with CRM. Um, <laughs> So we we have yes we have A or B questions like the one Harpreet answer, asked us but not about CRM. So first one is eggnog or hot chocolate? Eggnog. Hot chocolate. <laughs> All right. The next one. Mittens or gloves? Mittens. Um. I'll do both. It depends where I am, but I wear gloves more often than mittens. Sorry, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> what What do you got, Bob? Mittens. Okay, mittens. All right. All right. And because um, you're both from the great country of Canada, hockey or curling? Hockey. Hockey. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's the end. Oh, actually, you know what? A, a standing one is always Star Trek or Star Wars. Ooh. Star both? Wars. Star Wars. Star Wars. All right, Emily, oh, you got to choose. You got to pick one. Well, considering the fact that I took down all my inter or my Star Wars uh, spaceships behind me for this, <laughs> for this, for this. podcast, <laughs> for this podcast, yep. I will have to say Star Wars. <laughs> all right. Good. good. Well, it's been a real pleasure, both of you. Thank you so much um, for spending some time with us, especially during this busy week right before the holidays. Thank was, you for the opportunity. It's been great. Yeah, my pleasure, uh, Betsy. Glad to do it. Great to meet you and, and uh, be part of the conversation. You too. And uh, Jordan will um, end up sending this to you guys to, to use, hopefully, to help your teams as well. So great thank you look forward to hearing us live while we're doing our dishes and and doing our jogging Got it. <laughs> all right take have care a great, uh, holiday season everyone you too yeah, have a great holiday thank you Thanks.